Uh, we are um, getting the choir ready. Number one, we will not be having our five o'clock uh, classes this afternoon because we'll be going uh, down there. And we do have someone in the nursery. If you have a child that uh, needs to go to the nursery, would like to go to the nursery, uh, there is someone in our nursery. It's at the end of this hall uh, here. So uh, if you have someone that needs to, to go, feel free to take them. All right, gentlemen. I left you alone. <laughs> All right, our first hymn. No, excuse me. We got birthdays and anniversaries. Who was born in November? Oh. <laughs> Lots of old people according to Linda Powell over here. <laughs> yes, we know that. <laughs> All right, Joel. All right, let's get on with our birthday song so the Lester sisters won't fuss here. Here we go. <laughs> I turn around, my wife's standing up, and I think, yeah, there is her birthday this month. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, I'm not the smartest you ever seen. All right. All right, who got married in November? Uh, Scott's standing up like, huh? <laughs> All right, let's sing congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Take the hymn book and turn to number 353, and let's all stand. 353. <laughs> Oh, 
take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the book of Mark. That's the second of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, to the third chapter. And this morning, I'm going to pick up reading in the 13th verse. Mark, chapter 3, verse 13. The third chapter of Mark and the 13th verse. And Mark records for us. And he, that is Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those uh, he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to, to have power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boragines, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, and they went into a house. Then the multitudes came together so that they could not so much as eat. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Isn't that nice? <laughs> that was his mother and his brothers came to get him, and they said, he is out of his mind. That will help you. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub. That's the folks that are his opposition. Now his mom and, his mom and brothers have said he's out of his mind. And the next people say he's full of the devil. And by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. <clears throat> so he called them to himself and said to them in parables, how can ca Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be given the sons of men, and who, whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Because they, because they said he has an unclean spirit. Let me write quick like, I'm not going to be preaching through this passage. I'm going to go past it. We're just giving you a little bit of overview on it. And so I want to touch briefly on the unpardonable sin because there are folks that really wonder how they committed the unpardonable sin. And I want, to hear you, I want you to hear well this morning. You have not committed the unpardonable sin. My Bible says, whosoever will may come and be saved. Amen. There's none of you past... Uh, Saving The only unpardonable sin you will ever commit is the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ as your Savior. And as long as you have breath, you have opportunity to do that. A person that could have committed this sin was someone that lived in that day, and they would not hear Jesus, and they are credited to the works of Jesus, uh, to the works of the devil. They had blinded themselves and would not be forgiven. But that does not apply to you today. If you are hearing my voice, as a matter of fact, we're going to preach a gospel message here in a few minutes. And at the end of that gospel message, if the Holy Spirit tugs on your heart, today is the day of salvation for you. Now is the day you should come. No one has come to that place. <clears throat> then his brothers and his mothers came, and standing outside, they said to, said to him, calling him. And a multitude sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mo mother and my brothers? And that's not because they just called him crazy, by the way. <laughs> that might have been a good reason to ask that question. He said, And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my, my sister and my mother. Amen. Brother Doyle. Father, again, as we come to thee, just thank you for this day and thank you for bringing us to your house this morning, dear Father, and thank you that we can look around and see our fellow members and Christians that they come to your house this morning to worship you, Father, and we just thank you for, for that. We thank you for the time we had last night, dear Father. We, we thank you for each aspect of this reach out program that we have in this church, and Father, we thank you for the opportunity to participate in being part of building a new worship uh, facility, Father, and we just thank you for your blessings that you've handed out to us to, uh, to make that happen, Father. We know without it being your will and way, it could not be, and you have blessed each one that has brought forward ideas and 
monetary offerings and time and energy, Father, that's been in this, this project, and we appreciate it. And thank you so much for it, Father. We thank you for this fall season, Father, and we just, uh, it's pleasing to see the farmers come in with their crops and and get earnings for their year's uh, efforts that they've made to, to make their crops, and, and it's pleasant to, for the cool cooler weather, and, and we just thank you for the harvest that's been made in, in this community, dear Father, and the things that's done there for those guys to feed the enclosed world. Father, we just... Uh, think about our nation, Father, and we think about our forefathers that have, have um, been before us that were good Christian backbone to the community and, and this nation, nationwide, Father, and we just, uh, we have that heritage in each one of us, Father, that has been handed down, and we should keep it up, Father, and, and be all challenged to, uh, to put in Christian people and pray about who we vote for and and to go forward with with those ideas and, and our faith and our things that we we feel that's important to vote our conviction, Father. We ask that each one be challenged to make a special effort to, to do that. Father, we ask your blessings upon this service this morning that, that uh, as Brother Bruce brings this message that each one be attentive and listen. Father, we just uh, thank you for everything that, you, that you've done. We ask your blessings upon the sick, the afflicted, the, and the families of the bereaved. Father, bless each one of those. Father, we ask again that you go with us through this service. All this we ask in my name. Amen.
children, y'all come down for the children's corner. Man, who had a good time last night? Yeah, I had a good time, too. It was a lot of fun playing the games and everything and all the good eating. That was great, wasn't it? What was your favorite game from last night? Anybody want to share what your favorite one was? Yeah. Well, go ahead. Painting faces? Yeah, that was, that was, that was a lot of fun. What was yours? Knocking the bottles down with the yeah the the pantyhose and the ball in it, and you were trying to that was that was pretty neat, wasn't it? That was a lot of fun. What face painting? You like that part too? Yeah. That was your favorite one too. The face paint. Yeah, my favorite one was the football. I like playing football. I like that part. That was good. The what? Yeah, that's the one I brought. That's. <laughs> That may be why it was my favorite. I, I mean, what's that? That was pretty awesome, too. I like that one, too. So, Will was pretty good at the football part. He was pretty good at that. Me and Will, there was a few of us standing over there, and he rung the triangle one. That was like the toughest one. And I cut this one. It was huge. Y'all see the big circle that I had cut? And I cut that for maybe the little ones, but I couldn't even ring that one. That was, it was pretty bad. And uh, you, you hit the little one too? Yeah, yeah. So it would have been easy for me, right, to uh, kind of get upset with Will because he's better at throwing the football than I am. Does that ever happen to you guys? That don't ever happen to you? Well, it happens to me. Sometimes I get to playing games like that and I get a little uh, competitive. Does that ever happen to you? A little competitive, and it's easy for me to get a little upset when I start losing. And uh, yesterday when Will was throwing that football so good, it would be easy for me to kind of just say, you know, I don't want to play anymore. But I didn't. Will did a great job, and uh, I'm proud of him for throwing a football like that. He's getting pretty good at it. And I saw a lot of other good arms, too. A lot of you were throwing football pretty good. A lot of you were. And uh, I never really got to that point. I'm not a very good – I can catch a football if I'm standing still and somebody throws it really – lightly to me I can catch it really good but it got me to thinking because that is something that I've I've always struggled with and I thought maybe some of you guys might struggle with that too when we're playing games football or even when it comes to to just things that you do around the house like with your brothers and sisters and stuff you ever get competitive when it comes to that stuff too maybe yeah cheerleading some of you guys and dancing yeah you get into some of that stuff and you ever notice maybe the dancer or the cheerleader next to you may have their twist done a little better than you do? Does that kind of get to you? Just a little bit? Well, let me tell you something. The Bible says that this is Jesus speaking, okay? It comes out of John chapter 14, I'm sorry, chapter 15, verse 12. It says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's something we really need to keep in mind when we're playing these sports, when we're playing these games, especially if you're like me, Okay? What it means to love somebody else is to be excited for them, to be happy for them, to show them your love. All right? Will, buddy, I love you, and I'm glad you did such a good job throwing that football. All of you. I'm glad you're so good at it. I wish I could throw a football like that. I really do. That's the type of mind frame we ought to be in when we're showing God's love to others around us. Right? Right? And let me tell you something. It's easy. It's easy to lose that mind frame. Take it from me. All right, I was this close. I was this close to quit. All right? I, no, I wasn't like this. I was like this. Just this close. All right? Let's say a prayer. And let's, number one, let's thank God that we can have games and have fun like that, okay? And number two, let's ask God to help us, to help us to show our love to each other. All right? Let me bow your head.
But Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you that we can come together as a church family, Lord. We can come together as friends in your name and, and have a big time eating lots of food, Lord, and, and playing lots of games. And God, we can get out there and we can be competitive. We can, we can try our best and we can try to win certain parts, Lord. But God, the most important part is that we get out there and we show our love for each other and we show our love for you in the way that we behave and the things that we do, God. And Lord, I just pray that you help us, Lord, especially me. God, in competitive natures, sometimes it's, it's tough to show our love when things don't go our way. But we pray that you'll help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, several weeks ago, I said something about how we sang doxology. And y'all have done pretty good about praising God during doxology. Well, this is one of them praise hymns. And in and, and Bruce's words, we, want, we do not want to stand up and sing it like a funeral dirge. All right? So, well, this is how we're going to do it. It's number 12. It's praise him, praise him. We're not going to go praise him, praise him. We're going to stand up and get a pep in it. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Get some kick in it. You know, sort of like... Two seconds last night in the ball game. What happened? Georgia fans, y'all sleep? Field goal. All right. All right. Let's get some pep in this. Number twelve, the offertory
We always have harvest supper before the time changes so that uh, you'll be plenty full this morning and you won't be hungry because it's already 12.30 on your stomach time. So uh, Didi says not only does she get to choose the prayer, she gets to choose the singer also for the ceremony, and the chosen one is Tanya. So Tanya's going to be uh, singing for us, so you wouldn't want to miss that service at all. All right, take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew <clears throat> chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 17 through 20. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. <clears throat> Excuse me. Matthew is your first book of the New Testament. Sounds like you may have found that, so would you please stand in honor of the Word of God as I read these uh, four verses to us. Do not think I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For I surely say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. We come for a given purpose uh, to our church this morning, and that's given in the, as the purpose statement of our church. And it says, in all activities to glorify God as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. That's what we endeavor to do each Sunday as we come together. As we study this passage for us to see uh, here today, we are going through the life of Jesus chronologically. We tried to take a look as these steps of these three and a half or so years of ministry and, and how they work out in a time of fra uh, uh, fashion. If you're reading through the book of Matthew, of course, you realize uh, that this is the fifth chapter. And uh, you might think from reading the fourth chapter, which is the story of how Jesus went into the temptation, that immediately following that, uh, he uh, came and preached this lesson on the Beatitudes and those things happened. But if you've been with us a little bit, you realize a year of the ministry of Jesus has already passed. Uh, many things have already taken place. And uh, so now uh, he has come to the place where he is beginning to have uh, vehement, serious opposition. Now that opposition is primarily coming from the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Their religious system now they feel is at jeopardy. And they're going to rise up and do whatever is necessary uh, to protect their religious system. The problem is it was their religious system, not God's. Now Jesus, as he began to interface and interact with this opposition that was coming, uh, he wanted to make sure that those that were listening and us as we listen today understand what is the primary biblical proposition towards people. How does God view us and what can be done in relationship to that? See, that was the problem. They had a wrong view of what God needed. Probably there is no more frustrating place to be, and I'll give a couple examples, is to be a child and have parents that expect you to do something, but they're not clear in what they expect you to do. And so as you strive to meet and please that parent, you over and over again fail to do so because you're guessing at what they want and you're guessing wrong. And that, that causes a lot of problems inside of your family. Uh, just as an extra here to help us this morning because I'm a parent like you, uh, and we need, to do, we need to be very clear what we communicate to our children, what we want them to do, what our expectations of them are to be. And when we do that, they can clearly then look and try to meet uh, those expectations. And when we do, we can praise them so they can see they're doing what they need to do. It is frustrating to the parent and it's frustrating to the child when they try to meet an expectation and they don't know what that expectation is. Likewise in the workplace, if you work for someone and they have an expectation of what they uh, want you to do to complete the job, the task they've given you to do today, but you've not clearly communicated to them what that expectation is, and so they go and try to do a good job, but what they consider to be a good job does not meet your expectations, and so you have a frustrated employer and a frustrated employee. 
We need to learn to be good communicators. One of the things I've come to the conclusion that uh, over this uh, almost 40 years of preaching is I'm not as good a communicator as I think I am. That's, that, that would be a good place for that. I sometimes think I say things clearly, and evidently they are not as clear as they are to me. And what is frustrating to a congregation is to hear a message and, and not understand clearly what is being said. And so, uh, so here, Jesus wants to set the expectation. He wants to make sure that we clearly understand where we are and where we need to be. And so when you leave this place this morning, I want to at least to try to clearly communicate where you are. We will not get so much to where you need to be this morning. We will touch on that at the very end, but I want to make sure before you leave this place that you know where you are. So what do I expect you to be able to go out of this building this morning and answer the question of is where am I in relationship to God? Have you got that? If you've got that, raise your hand. We'll have a benediction and go home. No, no. No, that's what we're going to try to make you understand. So Jesus, now in the, about a year into his ministry, uh, I read over to you in the book of Mark uh, how he had called his uh, dis dis disciples, those that would become apostles, and he began to teach those 12 intimately. Uh, later on, he's going to send them out to preach, and he's going to give them the ability to heal diseases and to cast out demons. They are preaching a specific message. That message was given here, and that is the message of the kingdom of heaven. We talked about that in Wednesday night. As a matter of fact, if you miss Wednesday night prayer meeting, you're going to miss a lot of teaching that's going to help you understand what's taking place when I or any other pre preacher preaches to you. You have to understand the terms and what we're talking about. The kingdom of heaven was a prophesied period when the Messiah would come and offer himself to be the king of Israel. And he would then, once they accept that offer, and by the way, that's yet to take place, when they accept that Jesus will make a special place for the nation of Israel and they will give, be given prominence in the world. That's to take place in the period of time we call the millennial kingdom after the tribulation period and the rapture of the church. And so that message is being preached by Jesus and that's what he's going to commission the apostles to preach. And they're going to do that all the way up through the book, end of the book of Acts. When you understand that, that clears a lot of problems up. I can't go all those places this morning. I just tell you that as information. And so uh, he, he now he wants to set for them, having called them out to preach, he wants to set for them what they need to be preached. We have that in a, 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 a sermon here called the Sermon on the Mount. And it contains within it a very familiar passage called the Beatitudes. Now, I've preached many times on the Beatitudes, and I will do so again, but I'm just going to briefly give you a synopsis of who they are, what they were there for, so we can get to the main point, so you can leave this place knowing who you are. Where do you stand with God when you come into this world? And so the Beatitudes then give us uh, nine blessings and one rejoice of what it is to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. What is it going to be like uh, to be uh, doing that time when Jesus himself reigns? And of course, he gives those to us there. Now, the, uh, the principles that are behind the Beatitudes certainly are good today. Blessed is he who is poor of heart, or that person that has a humble heart. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, without a humble heart, you're not going to be able to have the relationship with God that you need to have, nor will you be able to have uh, the, uh, the right relationship or fellowship with humanity as you ought to have. There, there, there's nothing as obnoxious as an arrogant person. A person uh, that, that uh, has come to the place uh, where you can't tell them anything, they're right all the time, uh, they, don't, they don't accept anybody else's opinion, <clears throat> they're just arrogant. They believe they've got the whole way right. Hard to deal with some, someone like that. Uh, it, it is also, the Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And certainly in this day and age, there ought to be a hunger and thirst in the heart of believers to have a right standing with God, to live in the righteousness of God. And so, uh, so the Beatitudes and their basic underlying principles are certainly things that are good for today. But as written here in the passage, they were written as the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And he was given the laws that would take place. They, they had already been the Ten Commandments, the statutes, and the judgments that went with them. They had been the laws there uh, for about 1,500 years. 
And now he's saying, uh, here's what it'll take for the administration of the kingdom of heaven. This is what's going to be going on. Uh, having preached that then, uh, he wants them to understand what is the law? How do you fulfill the law? And is anybody in right relationship with God having kept the law? Is it possible for any person uh, to be right with God having done all God says to do? And of course, that was the question of the day. That's what the folks were asking. How can I be right with God? As a matter of fact, that ought to be a question that you ask. How can I be right with God? Uh, how is it uh, that a person that is born in iniquity, born in sin, uh, lives a life of sin, how can he possibly ever be made right with the righteous, holy God who himself is absolutely perfect, absolutely pure, absolutely without any blemish whatsoever, that he is always perfect and always requires those that are going to be around him to be perfect? How can I relate to him? How can, I, how can I get into that family or that fellowship? And that's the question the folks ask. And so he, he tells them, here's the answer. He says, don't think I've come to do away with the law. That's what many folks were saying, by the way. Uh, he is not respectful of the law, nor is he respectful of the prophets. You know why, don't you? You remember, uh, he had gone through the grain fields. He had plucked the heads of grain, rubbed them together, and his, uh, his uh, disciples had eaten them. Uh, they said, well, no man that does the law will do those things. And uh, he had gone to Samaria, and he had talked to the Samarian woman. And he said, nobody in right relationship with God would talk to a half-breed uh, like that. And so, so they were doing that. And they were accusing him of violating the Old Testament principles and the Old Testament laws. And so he comes to them and says, verse 17, don't think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets, but I've come to, uh, to, to fulfill those. And that was a tremendous statement. We'll read that in the three-word three, uh, uh, line there. Uh, but to those that were listening at him, I want to tell you, uh, they immediately picked their attention up. Uh, they tell us in preaching, one of the things that are our task to do is to uh, be able to grab and keep your attention. And it points during a message we're supposed to do things uh, that keep you in, informed, keep you uh, going on in the lesson so that you don't nap off. I occasionally see folks that nap off. And so evidently I'm not doing a good enough job sometimes in, in that, that manner of doing so. And so this Jesus was being the best preacher ever was. He comes along and he says something that, that piqued their attention. Now they might have been beginning to have to go into all the blessings and hearing all those things. I'm sure some of the folks, especially the Pharisees and scribes, already say, well, I'm doing all that. I must be right with God. And uh, so Jesus uh, looked at him and said, but I came to fulfill the law. And they looked at him, wait a minute, whoa, 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 buddy, row. Uh-uh. You're not fulfilling the law. You're not doing everything that we say you ought to do. You're not following the path that we have described and prescribed for you to follow. And how can you say something like that? I mean, that they would have immediately, their minds would have jumped to that conclusion. He says, for I assuredly or most assuredly or absolutely, I say to you, till heaven and pass, uh, earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will pass away from the law. For whoever breaks the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called least and the one that does will be called greatest. And so... Uh, so he says here uh, to these folks, I want you to understand in your arrogance you set here, but you're going to be judged by God one day for having caused folks not to understand what the law is. And so now he's going to tell them, here's uh, what I think about the law and how you've done it. He says, he says to them here that you uh, need to make sure and understand, he says, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm sure the scribes and the Pharisees at this point said, well, maybe he's not quite as bad as we thought he was. They didn't realize that this was going to be a sarcastic statement. They didn't catch uh, that, that he, was, he was going to drive the knife in them. They didn't understand that he was going to expose uh, the hearts of men through the hearts of the scribes and the Pharisees. So they stood there for a moment, and, and it was a brief moment, and said, you got that part right. You got to be good as us. Now, what was he saying? you got to understand who a scribe and a Pharisee and a Sadducee was to understand that. The scribes were those folks that had taken on the task of copying Scripture and passing it down. We owe them much. We owe them the Word of God. We owe this, this book that we have before us. Without them, we would not have it. They were meticulous. They copied the Scripture from another copy, and they would go over that Scripture. They'd do it a page at a time. And they would be absolute certain to copy exactly what was on this page to this page. Having copied the page, they would stop. And they would meticulously go over that copy. They would look for any blemish, any improper dot, any tittle. 
That's the reason Jesus, by the way, just said dot and tittle, jot and tittle. He said that he would look if there was a I was misplaced or a, a, a letter that was not crossed right. And if they come across any blemish, I don't care how small it was. Now, it would take them hours to copy one page. But they found one blemish, one place the oil, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, ink in the uh, uh, pen had uh, maybe blotted just a lip. They would take that page and put it in the fire and burn it up and start all over again. They were meticulous. That's one of the reasons you can know that you have a, a, a complete inspired Word of God. Those boys passed it down. See, when I write, number one, you can't read it. I learned in school the teachers would give you a break if you get enough of the question right and the rest you just scribble. And so I learned not to write as a child. And so I, I would write, and if I couldn't spell a word right, how do you end a word that you can't spell properly? Zzzz. Well, maybe he put it in there right. We'll give him a break. But that's, that's not how the scribes did. And because of that, they knew Scripture. I mean, just think about it. If you did your task, this was all you did all of your life, you sat down and you meticulously copied Scripture. And then you read that Scripture. You scrutinized it. And if it made the grade, you put it over here and you started on the next page. Do you think you got a pretty good idea of what the Scripture said uh, by the end of your lifetime? That's, that's the question. Yes or no? Yes. As a matter of fact, the good scribe could quote most of what we call the Old Testament. He had written it so much, he, it had become ingrained in him so much, he had looked at it so much, and so he was considered an expert at the Word. If anybody ought to have known the truth, ought to have known right, it ought to have been a scribe. And so they were looked up to. They were held in high esteem. They were considered the elite. They were considered the cream of the crop. They were considered the one that if you had a question about Scripture, who did you go to? If you had a question about the Scripture, who did you go to? Scribe. This is participatory. You're, 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 uh, you would go to scribe. And so the scribe, and then they had a counterpart over here called a Pharisee. Now a Pharisee was a person that had decided he would take that scripture that the scribe would get and he would interpret it and make application. And they became the folks that became the arbitrators of the law. And they would make decisions about the, about the law and about how things could, could go on and what could go on. And they tried to live up to the law. And guess what happens when you try to live up to the law? You find out you can't. So they had added much that would need to be done to the law. And so these Pharisees had become very meticulous at, uh, at uh, trying to outwardly keep up the law. Uh, they, they became good. One of the things they did, the scribe at times would have to write on the Sabbath day. Writing would be considered what? Work. And so that became necessary sometimes. So what they required was that you would take ink made out of some animal uh, stuff. I don't know how to say that word. And, uh, but it would only last for a period of time. We might call it disappearing ink. And so they would take this prescribed ink, and if they had to write on the, on the Sabbath day, they would write with it. Within several days, a week to ten days, that writing would disappear. And so they said, okay, if you must write on the Sabbath day, you have to write with disappearing ink. And so that was one of their laws. They, that's how they had done that. They, they had made uh, laws about tithing. You, you talk about Baptist preachers preaching on tithing, we don't have anything to a Pharisee. Now a Pharisee, what he would do out in public, let's say he was a spice dealer and he dealt in cumin. Anybody know what cumin is? It's a little seed. And, uh, and they would take, and they would count their seed in public. Have you ever seen one of these jars with, with those kind of things? They would go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, my tie. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, the rest of my tie. Twenty-one, twenty-two, as high as I can count. And they would, every tenth. They would set it out. And, and they would take their mint, their leaves, their, their spices, and they'd count them out in every tenth one day. And they'd do it in public. They'd want you to see, I am tithing to the letter of the law. I'm better than you are. This is what they do. As a matter of fact, the, Jesus would come along and say, oh, they tithe their cumin and their mint, and they ought to do so. That's what he was talking about. 
Th these were folks that meticulously kept every law. They, they made the interpretation of it, and they made absolutely certain that you knew what was right. And so they, they, they had the corner on doing things right. And so Jesus comes along now, and he looks at them in this congregation of folks, this group of folks, and he says, unless your righteousness exceeds what these guys think their righteousness is. Get that now. He didn't say they were righteous. He said, these boys, by their lives, you know, they think they are the most righteous. As a matter of fact, they are the place that you look at and say, if I can be as good as those folks, I'll be all right when I get to heaven. And they had accepted that mantle. They had accepted that idea from the people. And so they had abused and used that over the people. And so, uh, so here Jesus takes that example and he pulls it out and he looks at them and he says, All right, you folks, do you want to know how to be righteous with God? You've got to get more righteous than Billy Graham. You've got to get more righteous than uh, whoever you put up on a pedestal of religious success. He says, you've got to get better than them. I want to tell you, that became a high mark. And so the folks began to ask, is that impossible? But he also knew in the heart of those Pharisees, this is what I like about Scripture. This is what I like about God. God is a kind, merciful, gentle, loving God. Amen? God cares about people. He cares about you. You have failed. I have failed. But God cares about us. So God, uh, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, here, He gives them six examples that begin with, it has been said of old. And it's in the next passage just before us. It's not a six-point sermon coming. I know what you're thinking. <clears throat> uh, I will just briefly look at a couple of them. He said, here is what I'm talking about. Isn't it good? Jesus communicated so that these folks could know who they were in the sight of God. That's what I'm trying to communicate to you this morning. So you can walk out of this building and at least make an appropriate assessment of what a human being is apart from God. How every one of us are. And he says, here are some examples. He says, first of all, let's take the example of murder. He says, you think you're right. And he's looking right straight at the Pharisees. And he says, you have never killed anybody, and you would not think, as a matter of fact, you won't even touch a dead body. And you believe you're righteous before God because you are keeping the letter of the law, which is one of the commandments, says, thou shalt not kill. And it's because you have kept that meticulously, somehow you think that's righteous. But I want to tell you, here is the principle of the law. Here's the principle that God wrote. He said, God is not looking at your exterior. God is looking at your interior. And God knows your thoughts. And if you have walked here on planet Earth, and if you've looked at someone, and in your heart you have said something uh, about them, in the, in the sense that you demean them and degrade the image of God that is inside of them, you have committed murder in your heart and that's just as bad as if you went out here and you pulled a 45 and you stuck it to somebody and pulled the trigger you're alright I didn't have one uh, uh, stuck it to somebody and pulled the trigger and killed them in cold blooded murder because you've looked in their heart uh, because you've looked at them and you've decided in your heart that they don't deserve to live you've committed murder as a matter of fact he says if you say raka or they're fool the first word raka there means the literal translation of that word is empty headed if you Listen, get with me here. If you've ever looked at somebody, don't look at your wife or husband. If you've ever looked at somebody and said, you are empty-headed. You're senseless. God says he has judged you as a murderer because you demeaned the image of God in that person. This is a principle that has failed to be preached in our society. Your value in life is because you are an image barrier. You have been imprinted with the image of God. God stooped down from the heavens into the earth and he said, let us make man in our image. And what makes you important, whether you're in the womb or you're in the nursing home or whether you're some child with some handicap or something wrong with you or whether you consider yourself a genius, what makes you different in this world and what gives you value is that you have been imprinted with the image of God. That's where value comes from. Not how much money you have or don't have. Not where you live in society or don't live. Not whether you live in the upper crust of society or you live in the underbelly of society. That doesn't give you your image. Your image comes from God. And it's time the church returned to this principle teaching of the Word of God. And when we demean that image of any person, we have committed murder in our hearts. He gives us a couple of more here that I want us just briefly, my time's up, I want to give us briefly a look at. Uh, he says here, 
think I'm going to do this one because it's, uh, it's, it's so, so vital in, in our day and age. He takes that sacred institution of marriage. And these folks had demeaned marriage. Now, I'll give you my caveat. I give this every time I preach on this subject or uh, mention this subject. If you have been married and divorced or whatever that circumstance in your life is, God is a God of forgiveness. You go to him, you work out your problem, you forgive your spouse that you were married to, you get those problems dealt with, you are where you are now, and you live for God as you are in that place you are now. Quit worrying about the past if you've dealt appropriately with the past. But I want to tell you, for everybody else here, and I want us to understand, marriage is a covenant. It is not a legal binding institution on earth. Marriage is more than that. Folks today that think marriage is a contract, I want to tell you, your marriage is not a contract with this world. Your marriage is a covenant with God. My Bible says it is better not to vow than to vow and break that covenant. And so these folks had obliterated marriage. That was a male chauvinistic society. And they ruled. And so they had decided what the rules for divorce was. And guess who they leaned against? Women. The men could look for almost any reason, and the Pharisees would justify him for divorcing his wife. It really, it was a long, broad list of what could take place. And Jesus looked at them. He, see, Jesus picked out. He was loving, but he was wanting them to expose their heart. He was wanting them to see who they were. Their chance was they hadn't committed unpardonable sin. Their chance was they could come to see him. They could come to know him. They could be saved. And so he looks and says, you that have been writing divorce and have been doing these things, you are committing sin in the sight of Almighty God. He says, I, I want to tell you, you are in facing the judgment. He says, furthermore, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, and he says, these things you have done and are committing and causing folks to commit adultery. And the last one I look at this morning is go the second mile. And he was saying to them, what you need to do is have true love in your heart. Now, expediency or care sometimes or just want to be known by society will cause you to do right things. There are folks today, listen to me, there are folks that are lost that do good things. There are folks that don't know Jesus. There are atheists that do good things. That is common. That is normal to do. But Jesus says doing good things is not enough. Did you know that? That's what he's telling these Pharisees, scribes, and down through the ages, us. Doing good things is not enough. He said you have to be willing to go beyond that. And he uses an example that they would not do. He says you need to be able to go the second mile. You need to be able to do those things uh, that, that, are, that other folks won't do. And, and he talks about uh, compelling uh, uh, folks to go a different mile. Literally what's there, what's in view there is the Roman soldier. And that Roman soldier walking through an area, they had heavy packs. And what they could do, they could command you to pick up your pack, his pack, and carry it a certain distance. And you were required to do so. If not, you were uh, in, in judgment of the Roman law. You could get in serious trouble. And so what Jesus says, that Roman soldier, when he tells you to pick up his pack, you pick it up and carry it the prescribed distance and then say, no, sir, I want to carry it another one. I want to tell you, a Pharisee wouldn't have picked the pack up to begin with. And he certainly wasn't going to take it a second mile. And Jesus is driving the knife in his heart to say, you do not have righteousness. And so what, what did everybody else looking around saying? What did Jesus say? Except I have a righteousness. See, these guys, and look what they do. I can never do that. And so he puts his finger on where every human being enters the world. And listen, here's the point of the message, and I'm done. A person cannot be saved until they realize they're lost. I'm afraid our preaching has become so watered down and we've become so afraid to offend anyone that we preach a message of goodness rather than grace. Now listen, here's who you are before you came to know Jesus. If you're lost here this morning, I want you to hear this. You are unrighteous before God. And therefore you are alienated, cut apart from the things of God. You cannot see heaven in your own righteousness. 
I don't care how good you think. I don't care how good are things. I don't care if you've been good to your husband. You say, well, preacher, you preached about some things that I, I've never committed murder. Well, first of all, I doubt that, so now you've broken another commandment, thou shalt not lie. I bear false witness. I dare say, without judging you too harshly, there's not a person in this room that hadn't looked at somebody and said, mm, why did God let him breathe air? If I was God, you wouldn't be here. You know why we did that? Because we're born into this world unrighteous. I dare say there's a person in here that has taken an oath. I didn't cover this one, but has taken an oath and not broken that oath. It's been a minute person when life was very difficult. And they got that bad news of some kind. They said, oh, God, if you'll just get me out of this, I promise you, I'll go to church next Sunday, and I'll be faithful to what you do. And when they got out of the situation, how many times did they go to church? Big bad goose egg. You know what they just did? They broke an oath they made to heaven. No doubt there's been a month, Lord, my child is sick, and it has this dread disease. And God, if you'll just touch that heart, if you'll just change that child, if you'll just, if you'll just heal that body, God, I'll become faithful, and I'll give half of all my money to me. Now, if you made that, would you please stand up? Because I want to collect my half, or God's half for him. There's been a many person done that, hasn't there? Well, I give it all to you. By the way, it belonged to him anyhow. You wouldn't do any big thing. He's going to get it one day. Point of the message. The thing I want you to hear this morning. Now, there's hope. I don't have time to deal with hope this morning. That's called a dangling. There's hope. That hope is in the person of Jesus. That's what Jesus is coming for. That's the reason he's going to die. That's the reason he's going to rise again. That you might have his righteousness given to you. The only person that ever was righteous that walked on planet earth will be the man talking about the unrighteous folks and Jesus and you have to accept him. Before you accept him, you've got to know who you are. And listen, folks, if you've been saved this morning, you have been saved and made his righteous, not your righteousness. When you stand in heaven one day, and you ought to give God glory for that. It is our purpose in all activities to give God glory, to give glory to God as the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. They came and died for you and gave their life for you and prepared for you that you might have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That ought to cause a Baptist to shout. Not didn't, but it ought to. And uh, we ought to be at our altars rejoicing of what God's done for us. And our, this morning, I want you to hear me and hear me well. If your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of this world, I want to offer to you hope. And that hope is in the person of Jesus Christ. He loves you. He cared for you. He sent me to tell you this morning that you were a sinner. And if you stay that way, you're going to be separated from God. But if you will come and cast your care upon Him, there is no one in this building that He will not save. No one. You can come. So I ask you at the end of this message, this is a prayer, when we start singing, if you need Jesus, would you come? Would you give your heart and your life to Him? Would you trust Him this morning that your righteousness might not be your own, but it might be His? And here, dear saint, do you need to come? Is there a saint here this morning needs to come? And on this altar before God, say, God, I've tried to live in my own righteousness, and I'm living under those burdens, and I'm trying to carry that load. Lord, I'm going to give it up. I'm going to trust that your righteousness is good enough. I don't have enough. And maybe you just need to come to this altar and rejoice. Whatever the need is, would you come? Father, speak to our hearts, our lives this morning. Challenge us. Dig deeply into our being. Help us be able to walk out of this room today and see us as we are. Know who I am without Christ, and then hopefully some know who we are in Christ. Speak the hearts and lives this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we stand